money. money. The game everyone plays, but few win. Extracting the knowledge from the top 1%. Extracting the knowledge. And teaching you the ever-changing rules of play. It's time to level up and take control of the money game. Let's talk money. Big, big, big money. Yes! Welcome back to the money game. I've got a very special guest with us today, Brad Carlson. How you doing, man? Good. Thanks for having me. Dude, stoked to get to chat with you. For all the listeners, Brad and I actually met at a mutual friend's wedding about, was it four years ago? Yeah. Good friend of both of ours. Yeah. Stud, kind of a master networker. But uh, Brad, for you guys that don't know, is an unbelievably successful person. So I'm, I'm really excited because when I look at Brad and I kind of first met him, I was four years younger. I've done a lot more in my business career, but I look at the things that you've done and built and I'm like, that's something I aspire to do. That level of building and creativity and entrepreneurship, I think is awesome. But for you guys, Brad is kind of a serial entrepreneur. You started your first company at 19. Correct. And it's still running today. It's part of your, your holding company, right? Yes. So Brad's the CEO and founder of Empirical Holdings. They have about, your, your vision is 100 million in assets under management by 2027. So we're trying to get to a billion dollars by the time I'm 60. And it's not necessarily a billion dollars worth of revenue. It's a billion dollars worth of accumulated, um, basically assets under management, right? And yeah. so I kind of built the life in reverse and figured out what I needed to do each year over year to get there. And so um, I kind of had this unique capacity to build smaller operating companies, small cap companies. Um, I'm not the guy that's probably set to scale a company to a billion dollars, but to have a large group of those inside the holdings in hold for long-term play, that's what we're here to do. That's cool. And I, I definitely, some of the things you just said, I, uh, it's interesting is if I've talked with a lot of different people, you said you started at the end and kind of reverse engineered. You know what you need to do each year exponentially to compound on that. That is, I think, a really slept on detail of really successful people. They usually have a target and it's pretty detailed. Yeah, for, for most people, I believe they kind of wake up each day and it's insanity. It's the same thing over and over again, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, for me, there's kind of three tenses how I believe people live, the past, the present, and the future. So I try to utilize the past to plan the future, to live in the present. And luckily, I'm positioned to think more so to the future. So everything I'm doing from personal development to business development, I'm practicing to get to the next chapter. And there's not a book that teaches you how to go from a, B, C, D in the, in the world of business, right? Yeah. Um, I grew up in an entrepreneurial family. However, very different times, very different business. And along the way, I've had to learn how to grow myself so I can be there for the team to help grow them. Yeah. And I, I want to hit that because you, how, how old are you right now? So I'm 36. 36. So at 19, you're in college and you start your first company. That's pretty crazy. And it's successfully still running today. You just said you came from an entrepreneurial family. What type of things were going on in the home that I mean, even gave you maybe the background or the cojones to yeah. like say, hey, I'm going to send it on something. So uniquely, my father was a home builder in Kansas City, okay. 2,500 homes. And for wow. a home builder, that's a big builder. And he did it in the 80s and 90s when we didn't have technology. I mean, I remember when he purchased his first cell phone, remote phone, it was $10,000 to put it in the truck. The big and box. The big box one, yeah. And so I watched, uh, I was on the jobs at five years old and uh he taught me a lot of unique values, and I watched him in the way he would take clients, learn what they were seeking, create a vision for them, and be the bridge between the client, the architect, and kind of the end result. Mm-hmm. He was brilliant at it. And uh, I got a first, first uh, chair seat to see that. And so into my teens, I started managing people. Uh, probably had more responsibility than people do in their adult years at probably 10, 12 years old. But he threw me into it, and he kind of told me, Brad, we have nobody else that has our back besides each other. So I need you to to make sure these things happen. And he also said at an early age, he said, you can have anything you want in this world, but you have to first go earn it. Hmm. So that kind of stuck with me. Went to school. I was always your 
kind of second string guy in sports. I was never the best in anything. I was never uh, an A student. I was a C student and worked my tail off. And uh, school just didn't come easy for me. So when I had an opportunity in college, I played a couple years of Division II football. And with a best friend, uh, we'd buy and sell cars on kind of the weekends. Yeah. And we're always doing stuff to try to make money, just a bunch of dumb ideas that didn't work right. But then we kind of got pushed into buying and selling trucks. And the, the trucks that you would see that go to the independent contractors at FedEx, linen companies, we fell into the niche and kind of took a chance on it. And it was a, a best friend of mine at the time. We were 50-50 in the businesses. And kind of our big launch point was once we started doing a little bit, both of our parents, they really didn't appreciate the way we were spending our time. They wanted us to kind of finish school. So we kind of made a jump and Actually, my story is unique in the sense that my dad kind of gave me the ultimatum to either come back and run the business or I'm out. Oh, wow. And so I was out and I didn't talk to him for three years. Oh, geez. So it was one of those stories that was kind of tragic at first. We had a trouble probably 10, 12 years after that because I didn't come run the businesses with him. Yeah. And uh, there was a lot of resentment with that, but we've worked through it since then and have a great relationship now. But when you talk about our story... We started from nothing with no money, my, my best friend Blake and I. And uh, it was one of those scenarios where we would sell a truck. We had very good margins inside the trucks. Um, I was very mechanically savvy from kind of the industry we came up growing up in. And, uh, you know, on the weekends, I'd make sure the trucks were upfitted and our margins were tremendous. We might make ten, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 a truck. So once we would sell one, we'd go buy two. Yeah. By the time we were out of school, I think we owned 50 trucks outright. Oh, and, yeah, our... I think our senior year, we made half a million bucks, probably. <laughs> first year out was our first year of making a million bucks. And so we did really well quick. And it was one of those scenarios where him and I were work 24-7 on the business. And uh, he was brilliant at school. He graduated from Mizzou, summa cum laude. I actually had a chip on my shoulder and chose not to graduate with three hours left. And so I struggled through school, got all my classes except for one finish. And it was just like, man, I don't need this to define me kind of going forward. Yeah. And so my kind of chip on my shoulders, I ended up not finishing school on purpose. And uh, yeah, since then, it's been a unique story. So that's kind of how it all started out. That's insane. So it, there's a lot of things. I, from a mentality standpoint, I, I grew up in an entrepreneurial family too. Mm-hmm. And it's interesting. I actually, my parents from a very young age told us, you'll never work for us. And so it was a little different, but it would be so unique. What do you think, what drives you? Like what's going through your mind where I have, I mean, your dad's killing it. Yep. Obviously that number of homes, pre-technology, pre-software to scale is crazy. And you say, hey, like, dude, I'm going to take a chance on myself. Do you, have you been able to look back now with like 2020 and see like, what do you think drove that? Well, so one of the conversations my father and I had was kind of a, I think there was a a miscommunication on what I was wanting to do with what he had going on in his chapters, right? It was 2007. There was a downturn. It was a different world for him. Um, They had just gotten through 50 houses at a time type scenario for a builder to have 50 houses at once going unheard of even now, right? Yeah. And uh, I think he had a lot of emotions and he kind of told me, Hey, if you, if you do this, um, when you fail, and you will fail, you can crawl back on your knees and apologize. Oh, wow. And I said, I'll never crawl. And, uh, you know, that's the reality of I didn't have a backstop. Yeah. I didn't have anybody to go to. Um, in a sense, back then, I felt abandoned. So there was no other route but going forward. And so, uh, yeah, I had a chip on my shoulder. I, have, I always have. At a certain point, that chip has to go away as you as you navigate the different chapters. Mm -hmm. You can't use that same fuel that started you out later on. And so, yeah, I've navigated the waters with them. Probably was a big miscommunication on kind of timing, how things went. But I wouldn't trade it for the world because it turned me into a different human that I wasn't before. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, I didn't have anybody to go back to. And I I like that you said that because I think I run sales teams and do a lot of investing, but especially in my, my sales teams, 
people think that like one singular fuel is going to last forever and don't have the awareness to reallocate like, hey, what's moving me now? Or to process, hey, is the chip that got me here, at what point do I need to find a new reason, a new why, like a new fulfilling journey? Because I mean, you made a million bucks your first year out of college. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm sure at this point, and I, maybe I don't know the <clears throat> magnitude of your vision, but I'm sure pretty quickly the chip of like, hey, I'm going to crawl back on my knees dissipated. Like obviously making a million bucks that young, that quick you're on a rocket ship trajectory. What, like at what point did it start to like change from the chip to the new vision, the new purpose? What what was the build then? Yeah. I mean, so the interesting thing was it was less about my dynamic with my father than it was the dynamic now with my business partner, Hmm. very brilliant individual, more finance focused. Um, Our second year out, he had the, focus of, he's like, I think this thing should pivot into a finance company. So we went with a a group out of Kansas City to raise capital. Uh, And we went to 20 banks and 19 said no (laughs) and embarrassed us along the way. And uh, yeah, that was the the focus of where kind of Blake wanted to take the company. And so we started a leasing company and uh, we'd hold all the paper in our balance sheets and we'd sell it off to large insurance companies and make really good spreads. And it was a really good business. And so the uniqueness of it was my chapters were then finding new dynamics with my business partner. And uh, the same kind of saga that I went through with my father ended up having to go through with him. And we started the finance company. We started another company that we fell into that built specialty vehicles. So we had all the trucks. At that time, it was pre-owned and brand new. And the step van style of truck, the UPS style But brands and marketing companies would call us and say, hey, we want your truck, but we need someone to build it out. So I'm Mm -hmm. like, all right, I'll build it. So the first specialty vehicle that we built went to Levy Restaurants or the Bulls and Blackhawks, United Center. And so, yeah, then we started building specialty vehicles. So my whole journey was trying to figure out how to take care of myself personally along the way and grow with the business because I was doing sales, operations. I was managing the whole back end of the business while Blake did the front end. And I'm naturally like this evolution-based personality. It's like, it's got to be better. It's got to innovate. Yeah. Um, Blake was more of a, eh, it's good like it is. Let's mm. just try to make as much money as we can. And so ended up basically kind of uh, building another business. And so at that time, we had three companies at once. We had the specialty vehicle manufacturing side. We had the dealership. And then we had the finance side. And it was a lot. And him and I would work and compete to see who could work more hours. It became very dysfunctional. I mean, we were working 18 hour days fighting against each other. We'd have four to five hour arguments on stuff. And so it got to a point where one of us had to buy the other one out and it just made more sense for me to do that over him. So once again, I used every dollar I had to buy him out. So I had nothing and my business partner could retire multiple times over. And, uh, I used every dollar that I had to bet on myself again. And uh, I wanted to build something that would run without me. And most business owners, they all have different antecedents of why they start out, right? And uh, you've seen it. And for me, it was I wanted to build something that would run without me. I didn't want the the business that had a bunch of free cash flow coming off and I went and bought my lake house. I was, you know, living out of the business. No, I wanted to build something that was big and would run without me. That's where my journey pivoted to. So to answer your question from earlier, it wasn't about my father anymore or my business partner. It was about me. So to get to the next chapters, I mean, the amount of hours I would spend on myself a day trying to grow to be psychologically fierce and ready to have all these businesses in my hands and uh, all the chips on the table, that's what the last you know 10 years have been about. Wow. That's it. I love stories like that because I feel like sometimes I fall into this trap and I'll even, you know, look at you or somebody and I'm like, dude, that level where I, I genuinely feel it's obtainable. But then I hear like, you've got to stare into the mouth of the lion yeah. multiple times, put it all down mm-hmm. and bet on yourself. I feel like it, do you think that there's anything that you did or that you were studying or that you were doing that kind of drove that in you? Cause I've been trying to figure this out 
I think when I'm trying to replicate and obviously you're scaling, you want something that runs without you. I think that's like the, the apex of entrepreneurism. Can you displace yourself out of your business and, right. and it actually operates, but that's the people capital and the leadership capital, which I'm, I'm relentlessly trying to figure out and master. How have you actually pulled this off? Like, how are you figuring that out? Have you seen success in it? So, I would say this. I've had to pay to play. Okay. I've put a ton of money into the businesses. Like, I take very little out. I have some, you know, great toys, fun things like that. But yeah. it's all, I don't lose money when I buy cars, when I buy houses. Uh, I mean, there's a whole other side that I d- didn't speak about. Like, I've been doing development stuff with single family, multifamily properties on a smaller scale value add. I'm always doing stuff to make money on the side too. So every time I buy something, I wouldn't really lose money necessarily doing it. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's, it's an interesting question. So here's how I'd answer it. Over the years, I've had to pay to play big time. I've, I've spent each year millions of dollars trying to figure out how to get the team to go to the next level. Yeah. And the best example is if you watch the documentary on Michael Jordan. Mm -hmm. Michael Jordan won his first championship, and Phil Jackson comes up and says, hey, if you're going to have any durability in this league, you're going to have to figure out how to bring the players with you. So that's been my journey subconsciously. Once I watched that six, seven-part series, I was like, I'm not alone. Yeah. Because I could work 16, 18 hours a day, which is kind of what I've done forever, and – which really? I love a lot of people don't even realize that. I mean, I, I think so many people would look at what you've done and be like, man, I'd do anything to do that. But no, I mean, they will not. You, had, you said it, it's like to look the lion in the, the mouth every day. Like I wake up on certain days and it's like, I don't know how I'm going to go do this, but I don't have any other choice. And that, it's just a mentality. And so I had to figure out how I'm going to bring this team along with me. I brought different individuals in to run elements of the operation. I failed because they would bring their bad habits. Mm -hmm. So as you said earlier, my job is to set a vision for the organization and where we're going along with the objectives, kind of directional arrows of how we're going to get there. But I got to bring in good people. And I didn't do that for a period of time. I brought people in that had challenges. I thought it was going to be the Wolf of Wall Street for a while where it's like, bring them in, we'll kill it, and, and, and it'll sort itself out. It destroyed my culture bringing those people in. So COVID was the best thing for our organization because we cut down the amount of people we had, went back to the, the drawing board and rebuilt it in a, a different way. And the team that I have now, they're a bunch of rock stars. And mm. I am spending my time building those individuals into my Navy SEALs. And they are working behind the scenes. They're working relentless hours with me. Yeah. And yet they don't have equity in the business but they have something that money can't buy, which is basically they have buy into this thing, which is they're, sold than, on the vision. they're bigger than any one person. And eventually they'll probably own equity in the businesses, a few of these people that work uh, with me side by side right now. And so the, the biggest challenge of my career has not been to make money year over year. It's how do I bring in my values, my behaviors, and drive those into the individuals so I can make them next level with their, I'll say their personal and professional development. Yeah. And that's what we're doing right now. And that's the hardest thing is what you talked about earlier. You run a team and it's like getting those guys to be warriors every day when they have stuff going on. It's uh, it's not easy. Yeah. But uh, that's the chapter I'm in right now, which is we're building the team out. We're starting to scale and grow again. And, you know, overall I'd say, probably total revenue we've done today it's in the mid probably 250 to 275 mark so 275 million in revenue it's awesome from, from when i started it out good earnings ratio and all the money stayed in the business i i never lived out of it and the people that work with me they see that and yeah. so they see it's like this is something that's special it's unique and every day is a relentless fight to go the direction that the team is kind of set forth that is that's honestly, it, it's incredible because I, I am nowhere near those levels. I haven't had those challenges. But even in the six years I've been in my space, there's, I feel like I've seen a little micro snip of there's 
I don't know if you ever heard this, like you can only have one chief per tribe. Like not everyone's a chieftain. Like there's got to be villagers. And I think sometimes I've gotten into this. How do I put more people there? And what's my unique talent? How am I actually going to do this? But as you were talking, I was just kind of thinking about it. I always have this, this fascination with people like yourself who aren't the Elon Musk IQ inventors that can create that level of business. And it's like, what's the special skill? And I think you're, you kind of hit at it. Galvanizing people daily is like an unreal task to get people sold and bought on a vision. Do you think if you had to say like looking back, that's kind of like your ability to see that super long-term, always forward, always next, always innovate is like the unique superpower that you've brought to, to the table to build or like, is there something that you're like, this is the reason this skill set is where I dominate. So I always say I'm 50, 50, my parents, my dad was like this relentless beast, like just gets it done. Yeah. Love him to death for it. My mom was brilliant in the way she could learn, read people and influence people Mm -hmm. and ask questions. So kind of a combination of the two earlier on in my career, I was more my dad where I was like, just we're going just, Get it done. But then I evolved into, I'd say the number one skill set that I carry now is the ability to ask dynamic questions. And that's what you do all day long when you guys are going to your clients, you're trying to learn their needs. It's mm-hmm. the same with people, my employees, our clients, Yeah. what we're doing. You got to ask questions and you got to want to make it better. And that's, I'm a, like you said, I'm not a high IQ, a high IQ individual. However, I have this just relentless drive to make things better. So every day when I wake up and it's like, well, I'm going to get kicked in the gut this morning, in the face in the afternoon, but we also high five when we got some sales, it keeps me going. Right. And yeah. it's a unique, uh, it's a unique drive. I, I literally have acquired the skill set to be able to just take a beating and that's not for everybody. And it's, it's frankly, it's a unique, that's why when you watch the, the special with Jordan, it's like, I, I, I want to be like him. I, yeah. I believe I am a version of him just in a different sport. And uh, I can take a beating more so than most people can. And it's not for everybody. I, I feel that a lot. I, I was just having a conversation with one of my newer reps the other day. And he was in the car with me, shadowing me, and just phone blowing up, problem after problem after problem after problem. And I still go put up numbers. And he's like, dude, I like want to be there but I don't know that I can handle all that shit. And I literally just said, dude, if I had to do what I do today, year one, I would have imploded. Yep. And it's so cool to look back and it's become like a realization to me. If I want to be where you're at, like my conditioning and tolerance and toughness of problems, staying composed, staying dialed, unconditional commitment to the goal of shit hits the fan today. doesn't matter. We're going to win anyway. Shit hits the fan tomorrow. doesn't matter. We're going to win anyway. Like, I think in that documentary, you see Jordan, Scott, he's like, I ain't playing. He's like, I don't give a crap. Like, we're going to win anyway. We'll win whether you're here or not. You're spot on. I just got the chills because it's like, that's a winning mentality. I yeah. have a giant sign in our one of our manufacturing facilities that says winning is everything. I love and it. And literally, that's Kobe's quote. And I wake up every day and I think, what do I have to do today to win the battle? And as you know, in sales, it's all about activity. And it's the activity equals results. And uh, we do a unique, this is something, I I don't know, I'd love to get your perspective on it, but there's a lot of talk about goals, right? Mm -hmm. People are like, oh, I want, I'm going to do this this year. This is my goal. When you think about a goal, the definition of a goal is something you're trying to accomplish in the long and short or medium. But what happens when you're done with the goal? Most people that are just starting out and they're trying to get something going, a goal can be, a fictitious thing to run after something in the, re- the results slash habits arena is what I've evolved to in the sense that I'm more about the results ongoing. And mm-hmm. I, I know you are too, based on kind of what I know about you and then habits, habits will take you so much farther than a goal will. And I think it's important to have targets for the team to go after mm-hmm. in yourself. But when you go after a goal, it's a lonely win sometimes when you get there and then you're like, well, what's the next thing? And so we talked earlier, you constantly have to be evolving your perspective in what chapter you're in, knowing that the goal is going to change from what it was prior. 
it's constantly evolving and you got to elevate it while you're kind of winning or losing. And I think that's where a lot of individuals go wrong when they, when they get a little bit of a, you know, set aside from a win or a loss. Yeah. Is, uh, is that piece. And I, I actually, I love that you brought that up because I think this is a pretty controversial topic. There's all these books on goals and I think every sales thinks goals, 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 every business thinks goals, goals, goals. But it, in my short tenure, I've kind of, I, I super agree with you. I've realized, I feel like I'm very vision journey based and it's just the infinite game, Simon Sinek yeah. mentality. Like, exactly. I don't want to accomplish this year's number. I don't want to accomplish this five-year number. Like, I want to build legacies. I want to dominate. But the hard thing is, is I can't, not everybody can think that way. And I feel like goals are kind of like the first level of maturity to develop vision seeing people. Mm-hmm. Like, they've got to have a target or they just can't move. I don't know if you feel that way, like, there's like levels to the how far can people see in the future and a goal is like sometimes you got to have those for certain types of people, but there's just, I don't know, genetically or our past that create this where it's just, I just want to dominate perpetually forever. Like I've, I've tried to figure out like what creates that in people and I don't know if there's an answer. Gosh, I, I don't have a great answer for you. I know what caused it for me, right? There was an action off of a reaction for me. Everybody has their different, their different challenges at any one time in their life, and they have a choice. And I, I talk to David Nurse about this all the time, and it's like, you have to make the choice. If you want to help yourself, whether you're 25, single, wanting to do something, you have to make a choice. Whether you're 45, two kids, unhappy with your relationship, you have to make a choice. And so many people don't. They just sit around and... Just uh, posture and the, I feel bad for myself zone. Oh, I I was in a, a real estate webinar the other day and the guy presenting and said, people spend more time planning their vacation than they do their life or their income. And I, you, you said it earlier, like people just wake up on accident and insanity mode and just run it back and back and back yeah. and expect something different. And at least in my, I, I feel like the biggest difference in people that are moving the needle versus people that are just complaining is just a deliberate pursuit of something. You're intentional is the word that I would use to describe that you're spot on. And uh, yeah, people are victims. They have a victim mentality and yes, things have happened, but that was the past. It happened. It couldn't happen the other way it did. Mm-hmm. So you, all you have is your action forward. And that's why when I wake up every day and you're in the same boat, it's like, Hey, we got beat up yesterday a little bit. Today's a new day. I'm rolling and I'm doing things that are actively going to position me to be more successful today than I was the day before based on my experience. So that's that piece where I take the past and I plan the future. And every day, week, month, I'm constantly zigging and zagging. And what's interesting is I find that I'm six months to a year off of results that I'm trying to accomplish. Mm -hmm. I'm usually about six months to a year off where it's like, hey, if this year I want to do this or hit this threshold or I'm, I'm always close. Yeah. But that's okay. Cause I know that pattern exists. And once you know the pattern exists, you're like, Oh my gosh, this isn't as hard as everybody makes it out to be. Yeah. It's basically getting the vision of where you want to go is so important because most people, they mix, they mix up what the result or goal they're going after is in the first place. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's sometimes wrong. If someone's wanting to go after losing 10 pounds that's uh, maybe the wrong goal. Maybe being happy and healthy is the right goal, mm-hmm. but I'm going to work out four days a week yeah. to get to a point where I take care of that challenge and I eat right. That, the objectives of what accomplish the goal are so important. So when you look at a goal, you have to have the right objectives. You have to have the right tactics and strategies. And if you don't understand the relation of all those together, you're going to go after the wrong direction. Mm-hmm. And I feel like if anything, if this podcast can help somebody, it's like, Hey, make sure you align where you're going and then back into how you're going to get there. It's, it's really that simple. And then go do the activities that accomplish those objectives along the way. Next thing you know, your goal or result, it's happened. Yeah. I, I agree completely. Um, I kind of, just as you were talking, I, 
I want to, something you had said earlier kind of popped back into my head. Just you're always innovating and getting better and spending money and time to develop yourself. And I think mainstream, this is an interesting controversial topic too, but I, I also dropped out of school where I didn't know that. Yeah. So I, I was in the accounting program at a very good university and I dropped out and I remember my parents being pretty, pretty off and yeah, but it's obviously worked out and I'm independent. And so there's really not that much say, but betting on myself. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think I, I meet entrepreneurs like yourself and I feel like there's this just incorrect perception of like what progression and education means and being somebody who hasn't, obviously you've developed a ton of value for yourself in the marketplace. You can do business with most people that you want to connect with and you have the ability to get in and you figured out how to solve problems and create value for yourself. And I feel that most people are going to school hoping that it's going to create those skills or those mindsets. I personally think, I, I have my opinions on what I think not that it's negative, but secondary education, I don't think is creating the mindsets you're talking about or the skills necessary to solve problems. As you're building out companies, you're obviously hiring, you've got HR, you've got finance, you've got accounting. What are the things that are most important to you? Like, how do you view that element in your people? You're spot on. And it's interesting that you told me your story about not finishing school because everybody has a story. Mm -hmm. There's always a unique element to what drove them into this, the timing of their life, right? Interestingly, a majority of the people that are very successful that work with me, they all have a different upbringing in relation to their thoughts of school, whether it's their schooling from a grade school to high school to college. One of my, my, my right-hand person, she started working with us at, tw I think, 20 years old, intern. And she was in school. When she was out of school, she came on for marketing. And I, I one day said, all right, what's the magic bullet? What, what's, what's, she goes, they didn't really teach us anything that's practical for us to implement. I yeah. was there for four years. I didn't really learn anything. And prior to that, though, she'd been working with us. And her mother uh, is the CFO of a very large company. And she's, she's been able to see how her mother conducts herself, how she runs the household, the team. That's why she's going to be a badass yeah. is because she has a different perspective in school wasn't necessarily productive for her. Maybe she was able to gain more um, just experience time, et cetera, as far as that goes. But no, I mean, that's all the people that are on my team that I handpick going forward. It's all about being a good person first and foremost. Secondarily, it's going to be, what is your perspective on like how life has hit you? Yeah. What are you doing? And I think Elon Musk asked this question. It's like, tell me the things you've gone through in your life that are hard. Hmm. Frankly, those are the moments that are going to define you and yeah. you haven't, you have a reaction to it every time. And it's like, you either get a good choice or a bad choice. I know so many people that have had horrible things happen to them and they made a choice to be a victim. And so I think this non victim mentality is really important for our team as we grow and one of my biggest fears is as we grow, keeping this culture of communication, shared values, all these elements that make up a really good team, I want to make sure that we maintain that. So scaling is something that is, uh, that is on my radar of, hey, I don't want to scale too fast. So yeah. I'm building the team, the core operating team, to understand these values, behaviors, because if we can't hire those in the people in the operating companies, mm -hmm. We're not going to be successful managing multiple companies at once. It's just, it's just not going to go well. Yeah. And so, yeah, I think that past experience that derives if the individual is going to be successful when challenges, multiple challenges start happening at once because you have to mix personal and professional. Mm -hmm. And I believe they're the same thing. You, you, you don't go home and you're not a different person at home than you are when you come to work. Yes, one might compliment a certain way, but at the end of the day, the person is the person at home and at work. And we're trying to build an environment where we're, we're giving them skill sets to grow the relationship with their significant other, their kids. Um, there's all these different things that we can do to help, help with that. And 
what that's doing is that's giving us great people at work. Yeah. We're growing and evolving at a pace in which I now, I have to keep up with them. That's so awesome. That's, so that's how I'd say that. And then I just even one step further on that, just from somebody in your, your point with everything you've learned, I, I have kind of my opinion, and I'll, I'll share after, but you've got 19, 20-year-olds, 20 21-year-olds right now, I think. There's, there's so much opportunity out there, I, I think, in the market, like yeah. more than there maybe has ever been from ability to start businesses, do things. And I sit down, and there's still a lot of fear, like a lot of kids going to school, and they say they want to do this, that, and the other. But for you, if you had to say, like, if you're in that phase of your 20s and you want to do some of the things that you're doing at, at that level, obviously different niches, because yours is a very specific mm-hmm. niche of kind of high-level vehicle trucking yep. and manufacturing. But what do you think is something that, because most people, right, like they might not have the entrepreneurial family that we had. They might have been exposed to the CFO mom. Like yep. what types of things should people be putting themselves in front of or situations or experiences do you think would develop those like, mentalities and learning capacities to be the person, to become the person. It's really interesting. So if they want it, it's surrounding themselves with people that have already accomplished something similar that they're seeking, maybe in that chapter that they believe they're seeking, right? Because you might pivot your perspective from 20s to 30s to 40s. However, at least you had a direction you were trying to go. Mm Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, I think you have to be around the people that you admire and want to be like, but you have to remember that, like I told you earlier, my, one of my best traits is I've learned to ask questions. I have a really, really strong executive coach. He ran a $30 billion company. He's like my second dad. Wow. Been with him for 10 years. And I never go to Tony and say, Hey, I'm having this problem. What do I do? I have never one time been to him and said, what do I do? I go to him and say, Hey, Here's what I'm thinking about doing. Can I have your perspective on it? Mm-hmm. Tell me what your thoughts are. And he will communicate per his set of stories and experiences, a perspective. I take something from that. I add it to my tool belt and I go. And the number one thing that I think separates myself from and yourself from others is, is we go. I, I, I literally never sit around and paralyze myself with thought, it's like, get it, get it close and go and then evolve it on the way. And it's beautiful. My painting's never painted. It's being painted constantly along the way. And so, yeah, you got to go, you got to put yourself in the position to be with those people. It could be family members. And then there's the other side of it, which is you have to have the discipline to put a wall up between the people that do not serve you well. Mm-hmm. And which is really hard. It's really hard for people when they're in that dark chapter and, we're, and you're, everybody's going to be there. And so you have to have the discipline to say, I have to make a change. This isn't the right environment for me to be in personally or professionally. And you have to be mindful of that, intentional of that. And so there's, there are two very important elements that I think will help individuals that are wanting to do something actually go do something. I love, I have a huge takeaway on what you just said, and it's something I've been thinking about a ton as I'm developing people. I think it's, it's such a, it's a perspective that's so unique and it's, it, it's so under like noticed to just own the opportunity before you ask the question. When you're going, instead of saying, how do I do something? What would I do? What would you do? going with a direction, an idea you've thought out, you've executed, I'm going to go pull the trigger regardless. I would love the insight that I need to pivot, to innovate, to sharpen, to craft. Because yep. people like you and me, like we know when somebody comes to us and it's, hey, how do I solve X problem? The yep. first thought that pops in our mind, and I'm sure your coaches is, this person has applied absolutely zero intellectual capacity or effort to even remotely trying to solve yep. the problem. And we immediately are just like, this is such a pain in the ass. I'm going to have to do it anyway. But when somebody comes, I always say like just the, the time old slogan, you can't steer a parked car. Yes. You've got to be moving if you want to seek direction. I think that's so critical. And so many people miss that. You want to go to the next level. Like you have got to be willing to formulate a strategy 
have it shit on (laughs) like and be unafraid of that but recognize you'll never find the direction if you're not willing to take a direction oh you're, you're spot on i mean you literally have to gain confidence and experience to be able to be put in a position to, and, and people are always talking about, oh, let's make some mistakes and learn from it. I would rather learn from others' mistakes, frankly. Mm. However, have I made plenty of mistakes on the way? Yes, but I learn very quickly and I evolve and I never make those same segments of mistakes again. And making mistakes is not the objective. Yeah, It's gaining experience along the way. And you, you, you hit on the head. You got to go. You got to be willing to go and have an idea. And I think that's what the, it's going to be interesting to see what uh, you know what the next generation's perspectives are going to be mm-hmm. because mine yours a few others they're unique yeah. it's it's a perspective of there's opportunity everywhere how am I going to sustain from not drowning in it that's the way I have a quote on my wall it's like don't drown in the sea of opportunity my best decisions are the ones yeah. that I didn't go forward with mm. and uh yeah, every day I focus. The ability to just hone in on the main thing and yeah. eliminate the distractions. Think like this. You and I get to work on discipline. Discipline is something that every high performer has in one shape or form or another, right? Every mm-hmm. business has it. But the other word that, that most people live in is confinement. They're confined. This is how much I earn. This is the route mm-hmm. I have to go home. Yeah. I have to do this. I have to do that. Think about how beautiful it is to, to be able to sustain and, and grow discipline. And once you get a taste of it, it's like, I want more of it. And that's where you're at. You're just like, I, I'm a sponge. I want everything. And it's like, yeah. yep, once you get a taste of it, it is, uh, it's pretty beautiful to run after it. But being confined, it's like being in jail. There's, you have no options, no solutions. But the way to get out of that is to just start. Start with one step forward and uh, take yourself out of jail. I like that. I, I think that's a huge misconception too is discipline is confinement, but the reality is discipline is the path to freedom. Spot on. The healthier you are, the more disciplined with your diet, the more you can do, the longer you can go. I have people ask me all the time, when are you going to stop working? I'm like, dude, I am so far <laughs> from, like, I, I think you missed the point. Like, yeah. I don't want to retire at 30. Like, yeah. I want to build forever and I have options. Yes. I don't have to go in tomorrow because I'm, I'm not bound. Um, and I do want to, just as we close up, I, I do want to just get a few nuggets from you. I think everybody who's ran a successful business inherently also is very fiscally responsible and has some guidelines or things that you live by with your personal finances because when you're running large revenue streams and expenses okay. and liabilities and balance sheets, I feel like that's the best place to learn how to manage your home because you just, you can't fail, right? Yeah. Like there, there's, you, you got to be really good. You got other people depend on you, not just wife and the kids and the home, but for you, what are some of just like your personal financial principles you live by? Okay. So I'm going to take it to business. I'm going to bring it back to that. I, like it. I live by three things, control your cash, stick to your core business and know your numbers. Mm-hmm. Have I been perfect at all these over the years? No, I've had to learn to answer your question, the difference between finance, sales, marketing, in our case, supply chain, manufacturing operations. I had to learn every one of those and my strengths weren't inherently towards what I'll say the finance end. I had to, I had to put myself in a position to understand financials, balance sheets, and uh, it wasn't my strength. Mm-hmm. And so and I, if, if you're a great entrepreneur sales personality it never will be yeah and uh you have to take the time to figure out what what's important financially for you and what chapter for me it's i've never really had a this is you know i take 20 cents and put it away on every dollar it's just been i've paid myself the same for the past 10 years it's very marginal honestly i think i have people that get paid more in the company than i do and I'm just here to build something big. Yeah. And so I pay myself a certain dollar amount every month. I know it's coming in. I don't go live out of it. I don't go spend money uh, going to dinner on the company credit card. It's purely all business. Hmm. And everything else, uh, I basically pay myself a certain salary every month. 
and it's really simple for me to manage it. Yeah. I don't go past what I pay myself. And uh, I think everybody has to find what their unique blend is at any one time. And you have to remember, I'm going to bring it home for you on this one. So for the first eight years of my business, before I bought my business partner out, we paid each other $22,000 to $24,000 a year. Poverty level is at 30, wow. back then it was at 32,000. And there was one of the big cruxes. My business partner was very frugal, very cheap. We were making millions of dollars year over year. And we were getting paid 22,000. I literally lived broke for eight years. We lived in a duplex together. He was in one side, I was in the other. So when people sit here and say, oh, I want to go do really well, that was uh, 16 years ago I started. First eight years, paid myself $20,000. Did I like it? No. Did I learn a lot? Yes. The nicest thing I bought through that whole period, I kept every dollar in the business, was we got two new trucks. That was, that was the nicest thing we bought for eight years. So I learned what discipline was. And if you're wanting to start something and do something special, you have to sacrifice something. And so really when you think about what personal discipline in relation to finance is, it's sacrifice. Do I have the capacity to just say, no, I'm not going to spend the money on this today because that dollar and cent could be utilized somewhere else exponentially down the line to mm-hmm. change my life. And I know you live by this where it's like, you're doing something that's so big, no one can even fathom it. I have mad respect for it because what that equals is you're, you're sacrificing something you could have today for something tomorrow or consistency, or passive income, whatever it might be that you're going after. And not many people want to do that. Yeah. So they don't start the journey, and they just live in the, uh, the normal ebb and flow of the day. It's so interesting that you, in your first eight years, that you lived so frugally and just poured back into the business. And it's, I feel like, this is something that so many people miss in the stories of people like yourself who've built amazing things. I recently was in a meeting with our founder at Vivint and he, he actually super similarly had built in a very, like he, I I think he had said at year five, he was 10 million bucks a year. He was making and living on like 40,000 bucks and every dollar went into real estate or back into the company. And then he walked in and he said, Hey, you know, here's, you guys all have your nice sneakers on, you know, sales guys are always flexing. Mm-hmm. You could do what I do, but you won't because you're not willing to do what it took me to get here. Here's a box of $200,000 Louis Vuitton sneakers. I just bought my wife and myself a Rolls Royce this weekend, but it doesn't matter because I paid the price for 25 years before I was willing to ball out. And now I can do whatever I want. And I think seeing where you're at, it's people miss that sacrifice side mm-hmm. so much. It's the same story over and over again. Yeah. And, and you just have to figure out where you want to be inside of it. And if you're listening to this podcast, you're obviously wanting to do something with your life. You just have to figure out what you want it to be. And for me, I get my rocks off on building things better than they were. I, and so for me, it's really my incentive is to keep every dollar in the business. I invest in myself. We, we talked about diet. Diet is everything. Mm. My sleep my workout habits, who I connect with, we're, we're, we're identical there. And then when it comes to like what my journey is, it's constantly changing, right? Yeah. I have a significant other now, didn't have that before. So I had that advantage in my 20s. I was just just going yeah. hard. And uh, yeah, we, a few weeks ago, we actually put, the, the whole crew put in 120 hours. We're, we, we had issues building websites for years and kept getting just bad results. And so I said, screw it. We're going to build our own. And everybody's like, well, that's crazy. We can't do it. I'm like, I'll figure it out. And so we literally launched two new websites about a month and a half ago. In the last week we did it, it was 120 hours, five of us. And we killed ourselves to do it. The lead generation is 10 X what it was prior. And it's better quality wow. for two different companies. And uh, now I understand website development, but it's like, everybody's always like, if I tell people that they're like, Oh, you built your own websites. You're crazy. It's like, that's why I don't tell you. Because you don't get it. And so along the way, if you're truly wanting to do something special, no one's going to get what you're doing. Your parents didn't get why you didn't finish school, but you knew that you were going to do something bigger and special. Same with me. It's like 
I don't want to go back and finish school. No. It's, it's, my, it's a chip on my shoulder. It's like something that's important to me to be like, you don't have to have schooling per what I chose to do to be successful. Other engagements obviously have to for different professions, but yeah, you, you have to make that choice and, uh, and go. I love it. Well, dude, I, I could sit here and pick your brain all day. I, I'm learning a ton. A lot of the stuff I'm just selfishly is for me to be honest, but I know a ton of the people listening are going to get a ton out of this. Where can people, cause I'm going to get blown up when I release this, where can people keep track of you or stay in tune with what you're doing? What's the best place to kind of follow you? Yeah. You know, they talk about, uh, you know, you take your year off and you, you just bury yourself and no one knows <laughs> what you're doing. That's my year right now. I'm really trying to take this thing to a whole new trajectory, but yeah, on Instagram, my, my handle's Brad underscore Carlson underscore. And, uh, I'll be posting some some stuff as we go forward, probably later in the year as I get back into it. But yeah, that's that's a place someone can connect with me there. So love it. Well, dude, we appreciate you hopping on, guys. Hopefully, slow this down, take notes. I'm gonna go back and listen to it a couple times and get some notes. I've got some takeaways I got to implement in my business and my team. So I appreciate you, man. We'll catch you guys next time on the Money Game. Thank you. Make sure to like, rate, and review, and we'll be back soon. But in the meantime, hit us up on social media. Real money. Real money. Money is the answer. Y'all be cool, and we'll see you next time on The Money Game. Money. Money. Yes!